Gaudete, gaudete, Christus es natus, ex Maria Virgine, gaudete. Welcome to the Rediscovery Channel. This is the channel where I, Ivor Kovac, and my good friends Stilgar and Great Pharaoh take turns coming up with topics from history that the other person hasn't heard about and uh, usually doesn't know about, although not always. Today, however, I got something that you guys have both probably heard of, but maybe don't know everything there is to know. So I'm going to ask uh, you both, um, have you heard of the gypsies and what do you know about them? I mean, I, I've heard of the gypsies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Being European. So uh, we don't have a lot of gypsies in my country, Holland, but I was in uh, Oslo last week and I saw quite a few of them begging. Um, and of course, I know them from like uh, literature from like Dostoevsky and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, and I know that they are people most likely descended of uh, coming out of India somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, th that's about it. I mean, I know some of them, you know, like they travel around and they like music and food and they have some traditions about uh, getting young, uh, getting married young, I believe, for the girls. Um, but that's about it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, what about you, great, great Pharaoh? Do you have any? Uh, yeah, I know that uh, that gypsies are good uh, good con artists too. Like they'll tell you they need you to give a donation for a certain fund or this, this, and that, but they're really taking it for themselves. So yeah, yeah. that's what I know. That's my experience anyway. That videos from what I've seen from tourists. Yeah, but, actually, um, you guys are both correct. And it's true that the gypsies actually have a negative reputation in most parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> and actually, gypsies, the term gypsy is an exonym. The term that they use that's kind of a catch-all term that they have for themselves is Romani. Um, I'm going to try to kind of use that, but we'll see if that actually happens throughout this presentation. Um, so, so, yeah. Let's get started then. Um, gypsies actually have lots of different names for themselves. There's lots of different tribes of them with various various names. But the catch-all term that they choose for themselves that they tend to prefer is Romani. Uh, some places they still prefer to be called gypsies for, for various reasons. Um, as far as the term Romani goes, it's important not to confuse. It shouldn't be confused with Romania or Romanians. So, and this is where it is actually a bit confusing because uh, Romania has the highest population of gypsies in Europe, but gypsies are not Romanians except by citizenship. The resemblance between the term Romani and Romanians is actually a false cognate. So, the Romanians are um, descendants of the old Roman province of Dacia. And their language is actually derived from Latin, kind of like French and Spanish and Italian. Gypsies have their Romani. They have their origins in, um, in India. And that's where they come from originally. So uh, a lot of them do live in Romania. Romanians, they get enraged if you confuse them with gypsies. They don't, they don't like it. But there are a lot of them there. And um, actually... A lot of Romanians, I think they they do have a little bit of Indian DNA in their gene pool as a result of uh, gypsies that have assimilated over time. But most of the gypsies, however, have not assimilated. So, like I said, uh, they start they started in India, where you already had like uh, different groups of itinerant people. So, have you guys heard the word itinerant before? No, never. Uh, itinerant? No, I can't say I've heard this one. Yeah, it, it actually, so itinerant, uh, it refers to people that wander around for a living. They're nomadic people that okay. um, are not settled in one place. But basically, their, their livelihood involves moving around continuously. So there's still itinerant groups in India today that wander around for a living in different parts of India. And the uh, ancestors of the gypsies were one of these. Um, 
And it turns out that all the gypsy languages and dialects are actually derived from Sanskrit. And today they're similar to Hindi with lots of direct cognates. The, the gypsies, they have like a flag that's supposed to represent their whole community as a whole, even though they're scattered everywhere. And their flag actually looks kind of like the Indian flag. Both have a wheel in the center. In the case of the, um, the gypsy flag, the wheel is representative of the wheel on the wagon that because historically they would travel around in these wagons that they would also live in. So um, why are these people called gypsies and what does it mean? Well, um, gypsy is our word for them in the English language. In Spain, they're referred to as gitanos, and both words are actually corruptions of the medieval word for Egyptian in their languages. So like in medieval England, they referred to people from Egypt as gypsians. So it's a case of mistaken identity. Um, initially, the Romani or gypsies were thought to be from Egypt when they started coming into Europe. Um, and there's a legend in uh, medieval Europe about uh, about the Egyptians who refused. So you guys know, both of you, that uh, the Holy Family, they took refuge in Egypt for a while. Um, right. There was a myth that some Egyptians refused to shelter them as they were traveling throughout Egypt. And according to the myth, God cursed those people to wander around forever without a home. So Europeans thought that these guys were the descendants of Egyptians that were cursed to wander forever for refusing to give shelter to the Holy Family. So they just mm. referred to them as Egyptians in most parts of Europe, which, you know, it was like a corruption of the medieval word, but it stuck and got into modern parlance and continued, you wow. know, for up into modern times. So the English words uh, gyp and gypped derive from negative stereotypes about the gypsies. Um, when I was a kid, you know, people would still say, oh, you gypped me, you know, like to, to refer to somebody giving you a bad deal oh. that you regretted or, you know, yeah. oh, that's a gyp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it came from. That's good to know. That's cool. Yeah, that, yep. That, so it, <laughs> I haven't heard people using those terms anymore today talking like that. Um, I think the political correct movement has abolished the use of these words for the most part. But, you know, when we were kids, I definitely remember it being in common parlance, you know, like, oh, that's a jip. You'd see it in shows and stuff, people talking like that. But the, um, you know, the Romani, they've been working to kind of scrub those terms from the, uh, the, the common parlance with very okay. degrees of success because even to this day, like um, I think most most populations are not sympathetic towards uh, towards them. There's still a lot of negative uh, views and bad vibes. Um, so, at any rate, let's continue on. So, it wasn't until so people thought they were Egyptians basically in Europe up until the 1700s, uh, and in the 1700s there was a seminary student. Supposedly, his name was Vali Istvan. He was a seminary student from um, Hungary, studying at the University of Leiden in Netherlands. And while he was there, there were three other seminary students from Sri Lanka. And he heard them talking in their language and noticed a lot of similarities between that and the Romani language from his home, his home area. And so... Uh, he took like a, wrote down like a thousand words from those Sri Lankan guys with their definitions. And then when he went back home on break, he showed them to the local, uh, the local Romanis and at, you know, read them the words and they were able to understand most of them or all of them and translate them correctly. So that's where people started getting the idea that, um, this, these people actually originate from India. And after that, so there's some debate whether or not this guy actually existed. Um, but he, the, what he said, the information was passed on and published in a magazine in 1776. The story was published in the Vienna Gazette. 
Yeah, so it was published, and then it kind of spread, and more people started studying the Romani and their language, and it was pretty much confirmed. And then later on, it's been genetically confirmed that uh, that they do come from India. And I read some of the genetic studies. I'm not going to go into all the details. But uh, most of the Romani, the men, belong to haplogroup H1A1A M82. Well, I shouldn't say most. It varies depending on which population, which tribe of Romani. It can range from 10 to 60% of the male population belonging to this haplogroup, but it is the most commonly reoccurring haplogroup in all their populations. Um, and the closest affinity to them, uh, the population with the closest genetic affinity to them, is the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes of Northwest India, uh, most likely starting in Rajasthan. So the just so you guys know, the most of the Dravidian populations in India, they belong to some version of the H haplogroup, and also so our viewers would know. Um, and it, and lower in northern India, it's it's more like lower caste people that would have this, including untouchables. So. Um, these guys in India, uh, when they came into Europe, they they actually didn't know where they were from originally. They had oral traditions, but the oral traditions were far from complete and thorough, and they had no written language. So um, another another thing is that the term Roma is actually a garbling of Doma, and there's still groups of Doma in India. And in India, Doma is a catch-all term that refers to scheduled castes and tribes, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes collectively back over in India. So there we are. Um, and then the question is, why did they leave India? And again, there's no definitive answer because they didn't keep any written record and they don't have anything in their oral tradition. But there's a couple. Hmm? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just stop. OK. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of theories. Uh, one thing is studying their language. People have been able to trace the the route that they used, that they migrated from India into Europe, based on what loan words are in the Romani languages. So for the most part, it's it bears the most similarity to Hindi, but uh, there's loan words from Burashaki, Dardic, Ossetian, Armenian, and a lot from medieval Greek but none at all from Arabic. So the conclusion is that they took kind of a, from India, they left from the Hindu Kush, and they took a northern, they migrated across the northern regions of the Middle East, near the southern coast of the Caspian Sea, and, um, come, and uh, the Caucasus, southern side of the Caucasus Mountains, eventually coming into uh, Anatolia, which was controlled by the Byzantine Empire at the time. And at the time they come into the Byzantine Empire, it's already been a while since the Byzantines lost their holdings in uh, North Africa and the Middle East. So they're like it, you know, the Byzantines are out of contact with Egypt basically at this time. And when these people started coming in, they kind of assumed that they were from Egypt. And of course, the Romani didn't know where they were from, so they didn't really argue it. Um, there is a story from the Iranian chronicle known as the Shahnameh, which is a record of the, the Persian Shahs prior to Islam. There's a story in the Shahnameh that the ancestors of the gypsies entered Persia um, during the reign of Bahram Gore, or Bahram, Bahram V, uh, also known as Bahram Gore, who ruled Persia from 400 to 438 AD. And there's a story that he, according to the Chronicle, he asked the king of India to send him 10,000 luris, both male and female, who would serve as mu musicians in order to bring music to the poor citizens of Persia who weren't able to afford luxury, you know, luxury items and couldn't listen to music normally. So these people were supposed to perform for the, the poor of the Persian Empire for free. And Bahram gave each one a donkey, an ox, and one donkey load worth of wheat. And they were supposed to become settled uh, agriculturalists, like independent small farmers that entertained, that also entertained the, the poor Persian people. But instead, what they did is they ate the ox and all of the wheat. And the next year, they went back to the Shah to ask for more. 
And Bahram was so enraged at them that he told them to get lost and just go wander and beg for a living and don't bother me again, basically. So they did, according to the story, they became uh, nomads and there's still communities of nomads in uh, Iran to this day that are also still referred to as Luris. Um, you know, itinerant groups of people in Iran, they kind of wander around and they provide services in uh, crafting, like making tools and and blacksmithing, even to this day. Um, now, there's another more professional theory that the reason that they left India was because of the conquest of Mahmud, Mahmud of Ghazi, who lived from 998 to 1030. And uh, Mahmud basically waged a jihad on India from the year 1001 to 1026 AD. And these raids were very destructive. He destroyed a lot of Hindu temples and towns and created some severe economic disruptions in India. And uh, he drove in as far south as Gujarat, which is the area today, what we would consider the modern area of Gujarat, which is to the south of uh, Rajasthan. So he definitely went into the area and conquered the area that the ancestors of the gypsies come from. And they may have been descendants of prisoners of war, which were taken as Mahmud defeated the various armies in India that went against him. Those Indian armies were serviced by uh, workers who followed around the camps and provided services for the soldiers, including uh, repairing weapons and shoeing, I guess, shoeing the horses. But uh, they, they were taken and relocated further west into the Middle East, into Persia. And th that's one theory is that they came by that way. But um, I, I have my own theory that like, there's another possibility. So it's a fact that this guy went in and took over a lot of Western India. But it's also possible that since these people were already nomads, that when uh, Mahmud annexed these regions, it, their lives were very much disrupted but it also became possible for them to move further west. And so, you know, I've seen discussions about it, like why didn't they go further east and south into India? Well, there were other itinerant cultures that were already there. It'd be tough to compete with them, so they moved west into the Middle East. And, um, of course, it's hard to be a low-caste person in India. There's a lot of discrimination and limited opportunities for you. So they might have seen moving into the Middle East, which was largely an unknown area to them, as a step up, as an improvement. So that, that's my theory, is that they just were trying to get a better life. But of course, once they get into the Middle East, they become subject to other things like the jizya tax. And if you're already poor to begin with, then you know that's something that is going to be hard for you to, to, to pay. So rather than pay the jizya tax, they just kept moving. Of course, some of them remained in the Middle East and converted to Islam, but most of them continued to move west. And they started coming into the Byzantine Empire probably around 1068, where there's actually a Georgian text that was from that year that refers to a people called Adsen Kani. And according to the text, they were engaged in sorcery and evil deeds. And the Byzantines, they actually, um, in Greek, they referred to these these people as Athengani, which means ungodly, basically. And uh, corruptions of this term, Athengani, led to other words um, that like the Balkan Slavs would use that they'd apply to them, like Zagani and, and stuff like that. It comes from this Greek word, Athengani. Um, they're referenced by the patriarch Gregorius II Kyprios, who uh served from 1283 to 1289 as the byzantine patriarch and he made mention of them in terms of how to collect taxes from them basically uh so we know for a fact that they were there at least you know in the 13th century and then in the early 1300s they started to spread through the balkans and throughout the 1400s they spread through most of europe um for example they enter france for the first time in 1419 and Spain a bit later on. And then a second group of uh, gypsies comes into Spain from Africa 
in the year 1488, which probably just uh, is another reason why they thought they were from Egypt, because they came up across the uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, one group of them. Uh, so they enter Russia in 1501 and the British Isles in 1514, and the gross majority of Europeans just take them as Egyptians. They assume that they were Egyptians and refer to them as such in, you know, in their languages that they were speaking at the time. So what do gypsies do for a living? Um, mostly what they're going to do, and I've seen a lot of different things, is they're, they're going to travel around uh, from place to place, engaging in temporary work. They're going to provide services in cobbling, blacksmithing, masonry, tailoring, repairing weapons, making weapons, and then also music, acrobatics, juggling, ventriloquism, um, and then some less uh, respectable things like selling trinkets and good luck charms, palm reading, fortune telling, and uh, petty theft, sometimes prostitution, uh, and also scamming. There's like a lot of scamming that, that was done. Um, and for example, I've got an example here, like a common scam that they would do is they'd carry around a forged letter from the Pope, which said that, they, that they've been sentenced by the Pope uh, for their sins, the sins of their community, to live as nomads and never be able to settle. But the letter also instructed Europeans to give them food, money, and beer and exempt them from tolls and taxes. And uh, it, the letter did work. You know, enough uh, people fell for it. Mm, during the 1400s, they used to actually, they used to actually uh, spread rumors about themselves deliberately uh, among the European population to kind of help themselves. And actually, I have, um, there's a story in my family that my grandmother told me about, uh, we had an ancestor who got scammed by some gypsies. Basically, I, I'm not sure when it happened and what part of Europe. And since my grandmother's dead, I can't ask her. But uh, we had an ancestor who was living in this area where the houses had some kind of roofs that you had to put tar on them and you had to refresh the tar periodically or the roofs would sprout leaks. So there were some gypsies traveling through the area and they offered to put tar on everybody's roof. And my ancestor uh, agreed to do it. And I guess she paid them after they finished their work. Um, and the roofs did look like they had tar on them, but then it and and she paid them, and they left the area. But it turned out they actually didn't put tar on the roofs; they just painted them black. And there was really nothing that uh, they could do about it because the gypsies were already gone. So you can't like send the police or like it, it was pretty much it. Like uh, everybody got scammed. So I don't know uh, what part of Europe that would be or what time. Uh, maybe Stilgard. You know what does that sound like to you? I'm not sure, to be honest. It's hard to say. Since it's from my grandmother's side, I suspect Germany, because her ancestors mostly came from there. Um, but basically, uh, it, it, from what I've seen, the gypsies were allowed to just walk into Europe. Nobody tried to stop them. They weren't resisted in the way that uh, people resisted Muslims. And probably because they weren't violent. For the most part, they just peacefully came and maybe Europeans felt sorry for them, so they let them in. Um, but it wasn't very long before they started lashing out at the gypsy communities. So I wanna, I've wanna i got some reactions here that I wrote down a few of the reactions that uh, different governments and countries, uh, different ways they reacted to the gypsies. So for example, and this isn't everything, this is just a few. So in, in 1493, they were banned from Milan for theft and disturbing the peace, which is actually pretty mild compared to some of these other things. So in, in 1499, King Charles of Spain ordered all the gypsies to get out of Spain or be enslaved. If they decided to stay, they'd get sold into slavery. In 1510, they were banned from Switzerland on pain of death. In 1530, the English government passed the Egyptian Act of 1530 which ordered the expulsion, expulsion of gypsies from the realm, um, accusing them of lewdness, theft, and conning English citizens out of their money. From, mm. 15, yep. from 1551 to 1774, the government of the Holy Roman Empire made 133 laws against the gypsies, 
including a law which made it illegal to be a gypsy woman or an old gypsy man in Germany. For breaking the law, one could be flogged, branded, and then deported from the realm. Uh, so as a result of this persecution, some gypsies became violent. And uh, I might actually come back to that for some later topics because it looks like there's some interesting stories there. Some of them achieved uh, notoriety in the ways that they resisted. Um, in 1562, Queen Elizabeth of England signed an order to force the gypsies to settle permanently and cease their nomadic lifestyle to be executed. In 1619, King Philip III of Spain ordered all gypsies to leave Spain on pain of death, but exceptions were allowed for those who agreed to become settled and assimilate to the Spanish culture. So they have to stop dressing in their traditional ways, live in a house, and um, speak Spanish, like stop speaking uh, their language. In yeah. 1666, gypsy men caught in France uh, were sentenced to work in the galleys for life. And women had their heads shaved. So you don't want to just pass through France and get caught. And then in 1790, the king of Prussia decided to draft all the gypsy men into the military. Uh, some of the, some of, and of course this isn't everything, but what I've seen the most in terms of recurring punishments for the gypsies was flogging. It was very common for them to be whipped and also branded. Um, the gypsies were treated a bit better in Hungary in during the medieval period where they were with blacksmiths and also weapon making. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Hungarians referred to them as Pharaoh's people on official documents. So they're still thinking these people are you know, from Egypt. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was thinking about all this stuff. Like I was thinking about you, great Pharaoh. Like yeah. you get, you know, if, if you had the misfortune of going back in time and finding <laughs> yourself in Europe in the 1300s, You'd have to try to explain to these people that you're not a gypsy. And, uh -huh. and you'd be like, I mean, what would you even, you'd be like, no, I'm an Egyptian. And they'd be like, yes, I know. That's what, that's why you're, that's why you can't be here. You'd yeah. like, <laughs> it's, it's like, you'd have to, you, you'd have to deal with like mis this mistaken identity. Like, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, they didn't have the full, and to be fair, uh, during this time, you know, Islam had come. So there wasn't really much in the way of contact between uh, Europeans and uh, and the Middle East, certainly not Egypt. Like there was no contact. What are you going to do? Um, so in uh, in the 1800s, some gypsies start to become famous for being musicians. Like uh, and, I, and I got some names. There was a guy named Janos Bihari and another guy named Ferenc Bunko. And in Hungary, the nobility would retain gypsy violinists to play at their banquets, like when they're hosting a banquet. And the Russian nobility, like over in Russia, they would hire them to sing. And mm. so, uh, you know, they, they did acquire a good, as far as a good reputation goes, they did acquire one for being talented musicians and singers. Um, mm. In the 19th century in England, they, people started to take better views of them. Uh, sometimes seeing them as a positive element because they would travel around and bring uh, provide useful services to different towns like blacksmithing and making uh, uh, baskets and other things. And they would also sell goods in towns that were isolated and still hadn't been connected to the network of trains. So um, right. people would actually assemble to get news and goods from them. Um, in America, I think uh, the view of them was a bit better. So gypsies started coming. A lot of them came to America between 1880 and 1914. And yeah. many of them joined circuses as serving as performers, I guess, mm -hmm. acrobats and such, and also trainers, um, yeah. training animals. Some of them actually brought trained animals with them across the ocean, like bears and monkeys. Uh, which is interesting, you know, because you, back then you'd cross the ocean in a wooden boat. Imagine like you're crossing the ocean in a wooden boat and you're seasick and you're throwing up and uh, or you're sick from the water and some guy next to you has got his pet bear. <laughs> you got to go to sleep next to the pet bear. Goodness. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. So here yeah. they were they were kind of received a little better. Um, and then now 
I think probably the worst place for them, um, apart from the Islamic realms, was Germany. For the most part, the prejudice that Europeans felt towards gypsies was based on their culture and their dislike of certain aspects of their culture. And they, yeah. a lot of times, would try to just get them to assimilate. And then, you know, it's okay. But the Germans started to think there was a genetic component to their bad behavior, like it might just be in their blood rather than cultural. Um, so in, the, in 1886, Bismarck, he, um, he started collecting the complaints and bad reports about the gypsies. Uh, he says something, uh, complaints about the mischief caused by bands of gypsies traveling about in the Reich and their increased molestation of the population. And in 1899, um, he set up an organization to kind of collect and archive the complaints and keep tracks of their movements. And if, as we know, like during uh, World War II, Hitler tried to wipe them out, those that were inside of Germany. Um, he hated them and thought they were an inferior race, kind of like he hated the Jews as well. So They also, mm -hmm. they also wiped out most of the gypsies in Holland. Reading up on it as uh, as you're speaking, there were about four thousand five hundred in the Netherlands, and uh, most of them were uh, were wiped out. So. Yeah, I I saw some of that too. There was some hostility in the Netherlands as well. I think there was like gypsy hunting or something. Um, yeah, I haven't been able to to find that yet. Actually, it looks like most of it was. Uh, I know. I knew they were trying to keep them out. That's what I read. I remember from a long time ago in, in some history books that they were trying to keep them out and just make it hard to be here. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were never really like hunted or killed or anything like that, as far as I can tell. So yeah, but yeah, there weren't as there weren't nearly as many here compared to like some other places. Uh, and like uh, I've seen a documentary at one point, and I think it was like in. Romania or Hungary or one of these places, and uh, and it was like a large settlement of uh, the Roma mm -hmm. um, or the Gypsies, and um, and like the the conditions they were living in were just incredible, just uh, just a lot of drug use, just uh, trash all over the place, um, kids like very young smoking and doing drugs and stuff like that very interesting so yeah i came across some well it's, articles. And it's also disturbing <laughs> yeah I, I, w I would say so and, yeah. I, and i and, and i always say i always thought that they were catholics but i just read up and apparently there are they just adopted the religion of the the place that they live in um so you have a lot of catholics and just protestants uh here i guess in western europe but you also have orthodox ones and you have uh islamic <laughs> ones as well uh but then they keep some of their uh, own like hindu uh kind of uh, traditions that are still in their uh in the way they live so anyway and i was reading some other <laughs> stuff but, like apparently if you're not a, a roma you're yeah. a god you're a godsy probably, oh, okay. not, say, probably not saying that right and, and you weren't allowed to marry outside the roma uh people mm -hmm. um but nowadays they do accept some of that um and then there are also some stuff like uh, the girls are not supposed to have sex before marriage and they get very married very young um and if you uh the woman has to submit to the man and then if you uh, if the man hits the woman that's actually a uh, expression of love <laughs> <laughs> it's a love attack <laughs> yeah it's a love attack <laughs> so yeah anyway that is uh, quite uh, quite messed up i tell you that's uh, that's awful you know it sounds like islam in a way <laughs> that the man can beat his wife and things like that but uh, yeah, yeah that's just I, uh, observation you know that's awful yeah so uh, yeah you're actually right about uh that stuff still go i was going to come to some of that oh sorry um, yeah no it's cool man <laughs> it's, it's all right it's, it's cool so um yeah so the modern situation for a lot of uh gypsies is still not very good a lot of them do live in those poor conditions um and over time you know they they do have 
But some of them have definitely given up and assimilated into the European culture. And so every once in a while you have like Europeans that will go and take a genetic test to find out what they are and they find some Indian ancestry. And that is why you have Indian ancestry. There's also, you know, Jewish ancestry comes up sometimes too in people. It's because you had a Jewish or a, a gypsy ancestor that just couldn't take it anymore. And so they assimilated into the European culture and, you know, just exist now as a small fragment in your DNA. But, you know, like Romania, and again, they don't like it. And probably someone will be enraged at me for saying this, but just looking at a lot of them, I can tell that they're part Indian. And, you know, I have a lot of direct experience and knowledge about what happens when somebody who's fully European uh, mi mixes and marries with somebody from India, Indian person. Most of the time what happens is uh, they end up looking more like Europeans than they do like Indians. They usually will have like a European uh, skin color and hair color, but uh, then like dark yeah, eyes. I have seen that, yeah. So, and, you know, and, and if anybody's wondering why I'm fixating on this, uh, another problem that the gypsies have is that they're like another negative stereotype about them is they're often accused of kidnapping children. And I haven't seen any evidence in, that they actually did that. But sometimes what happens with gypsies is because they already have some uh, Indo-European DNA in their population, like their mixed race population, like most or people in India are actually mixed race. Every once in a while, you can have a kid, like two parents with brown skin and black hair, can ha sometimes have a kid with light skin and light hair. And when that happens, um, sometimes the Europeans will think, oh, there's no way you could have a kid like that. Look at you. They must have kidnapped that kid. And so they'll take the kids away uh, in those situations. And there were a couple of articles I read as I was doing my research about this recently happening in like Greece and England, um, where some gypsies, they had kids that looked like regular Europeans and the state took them away because they assumed that they kid they kidnapped them. But then they did uh, genetic, uh, genetic testing on the kids and found out, oh yeah, they're actually belong to those people and they had to give them back. Um, but you know, in medieval times, if something like that happened, well, there's no genetic testing. They're just going to take those kids. Um, really? There was no genetic testing back then? <laughs> <laughs> that surprises me. To, to my knowledge, there was no <laughs> genetic testing back then. Is that when they I, threw them in the ocean and then if they floated, they were white? <laughs> no. Oh, that's my goodness. Else. No, that's, that's, <laughs> witch, that's witchcraft. Um, I know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pulling your leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't help it. I got to say it, but uh, I'm very literal. So um, now as far as their religion and culture goes, it's kind of interesting. So obviously, originally they were Hindus. Some of them converted to Islam and some of them converted to Christianity. But for the most part, they it wasn't like a really sincere conversion. And they still maintained a lot of their practices and beliefs. Um, and of course, you know, they, they still engaged in practices which are condemned by uh, Christianity uh, mm -hmm. and also Islam, I suppose. In the Middle East, they cut your hands off. Um, yeah, Middle East, they're still using Sharia law and they, they don't really tell the rest of the world, like when they're in uh, the universal groups like uh, NATO and and they're dealing with the rest of the world, they use the Takiya, so people don't know that they're still using Sharia, but they're still using Sharia, you know, and they're, uh, uh, maybe it's not in uh, as obvious like cutting people's hands off and things like this, but they're still practicing a lot of the same awful uh, practices. Right. Yeah, and there's, I, to my knowledge, I, I think there's no gypsy population at all in Saudi Arabia, none at all. Um, it seems like they're mostly in uh, Iran, where, I mean, those that remained in the Middle East. I think there's actually some in Egypt, too, but um, mostly in Iran. And those that live in Iran, they don't really they don't really steal, to my knowledge. They just provide physical labor, like like services. They travel around and provide services. 
Um, especially like right now, Iran has the Islamic government where like if you put someone's eye out, they'll put your eye out. And I, I don't know if they cut their hands off, but like I, I definitely you know, probably they don't they don't engage in that over there. But um, a lot of them did ostensibly convert to uh, Catholicism, which was the dominant thing in most of Europe during the time during the medieval period. And a lot of them are still officially on paper. They're uh, Catholics today. However, again, like it, it wasn't exactly a full conversion. The, the Catholic gypsies, they have a saint that they call Kali Sarah. And uh, according to their tradition, Kali Sarah is the protector of the Romani. She cures sicknesses, brings good luck, fertility, and blesses business ventures. She's usually depicted as having... Uh, either extremely dark brown skin or actually black skin. And it turns out that Kali Sarah is actually the Hindu goddess Kali that they just literally dressed up as a saint. And there's a shrine of Kali Sarah. It's called uh, Les Saint. I'm going to try to read this French. I'm probably going to mess it up. It's called Les Saintes, Les Saintes Maries de la Mer. And it's in France. And um, the Romani have a ceremony where they take the statue of Kali Sarah, put it on a platform and take it down to the nearest body of water where they lower the platform until it touches the water. And then the people that are there, they throw flowers into the water while the statue is there. And this is a continuation of the, the Hindu custom of Durga Puja. It's the Durga Puja ceremony. Um, the Romani also practice Shaktiism still which is the worship of a god through a female counterpart or consort. Um, so a lot of them will, in, you know, in their culture, it takes the form of, uh, if they do pray to God, they, they try to do it through the Virgin Mary or Saint Anne. I guess they don't approach him directly. Um, and this is a holdover from their original practices. The Roma don't maintain their own priests or churches. So for if they want to have a religious ritual, they would utilize outsiders, slur it, um, for those functions. And as far as their, like, their tradition has always been that the elders are the spiritual leaders for their community. Um, so the Romani, however, uh, recently some Romani have been converting to like a Pentecostal, the Pentecostal uh, Christianity, the Pentecostal version. You know, got people that speak in tongues. Um, and these people are a small minority, but they are culturally significant because they're growing and they actually are making their own um, pre preachers and churches like they're having their own buildings and their own uh, priests or pastors for the first time in history. And when I was in Spain, I actually went to one of those uh, gypsy churches and uh, my experience was this. The, in terms of the, the practices and stuff, it was kind of similar to what the Assemblies of God were doing in Texas, which was where I was living at the time. And they adult, the adults were very, they seemed like very decent and civilized people. Um, however, the children were, uh, the children were not all that well behaved. Like, the, you know, in, in America, I think they pass around like the, 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 what is it? The tray or the bowl and you put money in it. I think most, at least that's like, that's what I've seen most of the time here. Um, but over there, they put the bowl in one place on a table and people would put money in it as they're going into the church. But they, they had to have like a guy guarding the money because the kids, as they would come by, they would try to take money out of the, the offering bowl. So uh, there's still some there's still some work that needs to be done um, as far as that goes, and there of course you know I only went to the one church I can't make like a whole generalization based on that but that's what I saw with my own eyes while I was there, um, uh, and Romani refer to outsiders collectively as gajo, which I may be pronouncing it wrong but it's spelled G A D G O, and this is kind of like uh, some you know one way it's kind of similar to Jews how uh, they refer to everybody outside of their community as, as Gentiles or Goyim. So like all three of us would be Gajo, and all three of us would also be Goyims. 
um, as far as both of those groups are concerned, just outsiders. And like you were saying, uh, some of the stuff about marriage, marriages are arranged, but the kids have a right to refuse. And um, this is like in India also. The, the marriages over there are all still arranged, but the kids can refuse if they want. Um, although the, though if you refuse every time, your parents might, will eventually give up on you and you could be forever alone. Um, and then the other thing is the father of the in the in the uh, the gypsy culture, the father of the groom pays the bride price. And this is the opposite of India, because in India, the the woman's father actually pays the groom. They call it a dowry. So this is kind of the opposite of that, which I thought was interesting. And then um, the, sex before marriage is frowned upon, which I agree with. That's good. That's how it should be for everybody. Um, but that's they're very strict on that in the gypsy community and uh, also in India, too. Um, so here's something else. Uh, gypsies are afraid of something called a mulo, which is either a ghost or vampire. It's some kind of undead. So the, the thing that they would traditionally do is when somebody dies, they destroy the property of the deceased, including the guy's wagon. They might burn the, wa the wagon down that the guy lived in completely. And the reason they destroy the property is because they're afraid that if it if it remains, then this person might return as a mulo and haunt the living. Um, there's lots of taboos about and purity requirements about physical purity, which also uh, governs how they interact with outsiders, gajos, and they actually tend to view gajo gajos as unclean. So, you know, that's one of the reasons maybe why they don't want to get close with us and and um, the upper part, one thing that's kind of interesting is the upper part of the human body is considered clean, while the lower part is considered dirty, which makes sense because the lower part is what you use to go to the bathroom, you know, from both sides. And the last thing I wanna do here, guys, is I wanna read a folk tale from uh, like a traditional uh, uh, Romani folk tale so they, like I said, they had an oral culture. Um, there's a legendary hero that they call Mundro Salomon, which means wise Solomon in their language. Um, and, the, and, our, and sometimes they refer to him as O Gajivar Yanko. But basically, Mundro Sal Salomon is like a mythical wise man that they tell stories about. He's a cunning guy. So I found one of those stories, which I'll just read to you guys, and then I'll knock off. Um, so, so here it is. One day, Mundro Salomon learned that the Martia, or angel of death, was about to come and claim the soul of the village miller who was his friend. He went to the Martia and asked her to spare the miller's life because he had small children to support, and the people of the village needed him to grind their corn. She refused, so M Mundro Salomon tricked her. How could you take his soul, he asked her, if he locked himself in a room? I would simply dissolve into smoke and slip under the door, she told him. Rubbish, Salomon replied. You mean you could slip inside this pea shooter I'm whittling for the miller's son? To prove it, the martia dissolved into smoke and entered the pea shooter. Salomon then plugged both ends of the pea shooter, trapping the martia inside. He locked the pea shooter inside a metal box and rowed out to the sea in a boat and dumped the box over the side. For seven years, nobody died, until one day two fishermen casting their nets caught the metal box and retrieved it. They smashed it open, found the pea shooter, and unplugged it, allowing the martia to escape. Now she began to search for Salomon to get her revenge, but Salomon had anticipated she might escape and had taken precautions. He had shot his horse backwards, so that the prince of the horseshoes led the Martia to look for seven years in the wrong direction. She then realized her blunder and spent another seven years looking in the right direction. She finally found Salomon, now an elderly man. Now I'm going to make you suffer, she told him. For seven years I will freeze you in ice, then for another seven years I will roast you in fire. Then for seven years I will turn you into rotten pulpwood, and you will be nibbled on by maggots. Only after this will I put you out of your misery and take your soul. Rubbish, Salomon said mockingly. How can you take my soul? You haven't the power. You're bluffing me. 
I'll show you, the Martyr screamed and blew three times on his face. Salomon died smiling. He had outwitted the Martyr even in death. So kind of cool story. And it's also interesting that in their culture, the Grim Reaper is a, is a female. And, um, you know, one thing that's, uh, you know, I, that you guys probably you know about me is I'm a big Marvel fan. And in the Marvel, con- or I used to be, I don't like what they're doing now. But I used to be a big Marvel fan, I should say. In the Marvel Universe, death is uh, a female. Like they make the Grim Reaper a woman, which was the first time you know I'd ever seen anybody do that. Usually it's a male or it's just a skeleton, which is inferred to be male. But it, like in the gypsy culture, um, the, uh, the, the spirit of death, the Grim Reaper, whatever, is a female. And also in Marvel Comics. And, you know, there's two characters in Marvel Comics that come from uh, Gypsy Origins. You know, you guys know who they are? Uh, you're going to have to uh, refresh my memory. They're uh, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. They're half Gypsy, half Jewish. And their uh, father is Magneto and their mother was like a Gypsy from a, one of the caravans. So, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit on the side there, but, it, you know, it, I bring that, that up because it's an example of like uh, aspects <laughs> of the Gypsy culture bleeding over into the the mainstream culture influencing a major uh, entertainment provider like Marvel Comics back in the day after World War II. So at any rate, that's all I got. There's actually a lot more to their history and everything. Even though this is kind of long, it's still only scratching the surface. Um, I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, like because when I was a kid, my, uh, you know, my grandmother in America, we don't really we don't really see them. Um, very much, but uh, and and if even if you do see them, you wouldn't assume like that person is a, a gypsy or a Romani. Uh, but um, you know, over in Europe, it's still kind of it's still kind of a big deal, and uh, they're not treated very well over there. Um, in like Eastern Europe, a lot of them do live in hovels, and a lot of them live. They've been forced to settle by the governments. Some still wander around. Uh, but a lot of them are sedentary, but in a lot of cases, they don't have basic amenities like electricity. They, they don't attend uh, school in Romania and yeah, they don't even, they that's don't part even. Of, that's part of the culture is not attending school. Yeah, that, right. It's a, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a self-perpetuating cycle because mm-hmm. um, in their culture, a lot of they don't really want to assimilate, um, you know, and so that that makes things harder for them, you know. Yeah, because I think a lot of their poverty is is a direct result of their culture as well. So yeah, like there's a lot of prejudice against gypsies in Europe, um, mm-hmm. but to me that's also the point that you know, like you should always look at the individual for sure and give the individual a chance. Uh, but if you look at like a lot of these prejudices are rooted in experience, right? So, so like um, you know, like the, you know, the idea of like um, property ownership, for example, is not as like the, you know, like they are. They think that stealing is not necessarily um, a negative thing. It's also something you can show that you know, like your skill. It's a way to show your skill. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was actually just reading up on a quote from a Dutch uh, uh, Roma um, uh, expert, apparently, Alain Reiniers. And uh, from, from Dutch to English, uh, the, the gypsy sees the world of the Godsey as a fruit tree of which he picks the fruit, <laughs> as many as he can. When there's nothing left to pick, he ha- either has to change the tree uh, change the terrain, uh, area, uh, or place of work. Um, so, yeah, they have a, a lower uh, job participation rate here in the Netherlands, and their crime rate is higher. Um, and also, like, there's very high levels of uh, uh, of them that can't even read, right? Because they yeah. because they don't go to school. I actually know from my my mother that when she was growing up in a small uh, town in Holland, uh, in a in a dirt poor area, um, 
you know, she's a boomer. Like there were like most of the people then had big families. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end there were some, uh, some Roma living and they would go out. Like the kids would be naked walking through the canals, mm -hmm. trying to hunt birds. And, uh, you know, one of, uh, one of the families, uh, their son was hanging out with them and he ended up, you know, like picking up some of their traditions as well. And basically, you know, dropping out of school um so it's it's kind of um uh, yeah they are discriminated against but there's there's also like if you if you walk around in like i was in oslo like they sit everywhere and they just like sit there like you know get a job or something they're just sitting there at, you know they're not even providing entertainment which right. is supposed to be something they do and i've also seen them have uh saw one video but still like it's like it was in sweden and um, they were fighting over who gets the bag where. And these <laughs> these gypsies were literally pulling down their, uh, well, they were wearing dresses and apparently no underwear. They were shitting in their hands and throwing feces at each other to, see, to determine who gets uh, to bag where. So, uh -huh. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of cultural stuff, music and everything and beautiful things. But I think it's also interesting like yeah you know your culture has a huge impact on how successful you are as a people and uh and and i think some prejudices some prejudices are, are, yeah are sometimes some rooted facts. in like historical uh, uh what do you call it right. or, yeah yeah i mean it, it is in their case it is uh like like i said they were welcomed you know like people didn't feel threatened by them when they were just walking into europe even though you know they most for the most part did not look like Europeans. Um, they were still allowed in, whereas people resisted tooth and nail against like Muslims and uh, you know Mongols. Although the resistance to the Mongols was mostly futile, but um, yeah, they let these people walk in. But then they wore out their welcome and and. But you know, one thing else on the other side of it is that I'll, when they did try to like, okay, yeah, we'll assimilate. Then a lot of people, like in Spain and other places, didn't want to live next to them. So, like, okay, we'll take up the sedentary lifestyle and assimilate, but then, like, ah, I don't want to uh, be next to these people, or you know, like, and they don't want them to come into the church. So, like, they had these these um, pagan customs that they continued, but. You yeah, know, they weren't well, always welcome to come into the church service. At the well, same sometimes, time, so. you know, people are also afraid of cultural infection. Um, I would say in Dutch, there's a saying uh, that basically says uh, who you hang out with. Uh, uh, yeah, ends up infecting you. Right. Well, so it's like literally translated. But so if you hang out with people that are into crime or into bad things, or, you know, like have certain religious uh, practices that aren't um, a kosher, so to say, mm -hmm. then, you know, if you're impressionable, that could, you know, infect the way you, your kids or you end up living your life. So it's, um, yeah, I know, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. As a Christian, we're supposed to hang out with everybody and spread the good news. Right. Um, but uh, I do think that they're there. It's just part of human nature, I think. And um to to yeah like to be to exclude things that are different and to be suspicious especially if we think it's it could have a negative influence on us and i think actually a lot of current day racism is rooted into into that so but anyway yeah, yeah. it just depends like uh i don't know i, I think uh, i i think sometimes race prejudice can be based on real things, but sometimes it's just somebody is an idiot and they don't know anything about. Oh, I, th I think uh, absolutely most of the time that is the case now. Like there are a lot of black Dutch people that are just like any other Dutch person, you know, um, and then they get thrown under the bus for people that, you know, just came out of Somalia, which have obviously very different cultural uh, identity and ethics than, than than the average Dutch person does. So yeah, I think I yeah. think with everything you need to just stop and think, you know, because like when these people came into Europe, they thought they were Egyptians. So like if if great Pharaoh were coming into Europe, he might get connected with these people and have to deal with some stuff that he didn't have anything to do with. It wouldn't be fair, you know. So yeah, 
it, it, you know, stop. It's like, I, I, I wish everybody, like, whatever it is, you know, like, if they're running around naked in your neighborhood and, and, and going to the bathroom in public, yeah, then you got to deal with that. But at the same time, you ought to, you ought to use your brain, you know, and just like think about everything before you really react to, to stuff, you know? So, it, cause it would be unfortunate to be mistaken for something that you had nothing to do with because other yeah. people don't even like stop and think for two seconds. I agree a um, hundred percent. Well, completely. And also like, it's, it must be hard if you get confused for like one of these groups that's frowned upon yeah, uh, or even if you're one of them, like uh, originally, but you're just trying to be a good person, and then you get like, yeah, like you don't want to hear all that stuff about your yeah, or, or they, people give you give you like, looks, or yeah, that's that's the worst. That's like, no, yeah. I'm respectable. I have a job. Yeah. I'm doing everything. Leave me alone. Yeah, like, and then people still it. follow you around in the store or whatever because they think you're gonna steal or whatever. So yeah, no, definitely. I mean, we get we're getting a lot of that too. Like as as white guys, you know. Like they want to blame us for uh, something that happened in Middle Ages, like like um, some of the articles and, and stuff that I read. A, a lot of the stuff was was actually a biased in favor, and uh, like one of them was like, ah, oh, you know, it, it's like the white people are so bad. That's why they did this to them. They didn't do anything. They were just peaceful traveling merchants, and like they did provide a lot of merchant services and and valuable services, but they also did other things too, right? And you know, it, and so the negative stereotypes were came came in came as a result of uh, things that. But like, you know, like I don't want to be blamed for like something that happened in the medieval ages in World War Two. Like they do that in in here in America and even in Netherlands. I guess you told me like, oh, your your ancestors were so bad and you're so bad and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of racial hostility yeah. that's being yeah, so, so that's a similar so, thing. It's also like, yeah, no, I, I with you completely. Yeah, that, yeah. I, that's why that's why I just like kind my, of, my ancestors were uh, dirt poor farmers. So I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, my ancestor lived in a hut with a thatched roof, apparently that had to have tar on the roof. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate. Now that we've offended everybody under the sun. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, um, I don't know. I don't think we, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's oh, not our, it, there's no easy solutions for this. And uh, except, except for actually ju judging individuals by their character instead of uh, whatever other yeah, that's, marks that's they what, have. Yeah, that's what you have to do. Like you have to just take everybody as individuals, even if they come from some uh, group that has a negative reputation, because no individual is responsible for the behavior of an entire group, unless maybe you're Genghis Khan or, or Joseph Stalin, you're somebody that's like really big and powerful, but most people are not big and powerful. So, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. should be nice to the uh, Egyptians, especially. <laughs> Blessed are my people of Egypt, as the good the old testament says, I think in Isaiah. I think. Oh no, in Isaiah I know it says out of the midst of Egypt thou cast my altar. So and like you mentioned in the beginning, you know, the Holy Family came to Egypt to uh flee from Herod. Yeah. So yeah, you know, a lot of blessed uh, sites and stuff where the Holy Family were. And, you know, and uh, the Coptic Church has been in Egypt since the beginning. I mean, St. Mark the Apostle came all the way from from uh, uh, Rome, I believe. He, he came to Egypt and uh, preached the gospel, you know. So yep. a lot of history. You have to be nice to the Egyptians, you know. And yeah. not, they, they've been under 1,600 years of oppression. After all that, they've been uh, under the... Islamic uh, state, so you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then they argue. But then they argue that they're 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 from the Egyptian descent. No, like most of the Muslims are going to come from the Air Arabian Peninsula descent. But most of the Coptic, all the Coptic Christians, are are pretty much from it, the ancient Egyptian line. There was obviously there's Arab and. Coptic mixed, obviously, but uh, that's pretty much the division. 
that's the way it goes, you know? Yeah, I think, like, with Egypt, the gene flow didn't go from Arabs to Egyptians. I think it went from Egyptians to Arabs because, like, a, you know, like, if you're, if you're in Egypt, you cannot, like, if you're, an, if you're a Christian, you can't just marry a Muslim woman. Like, their family yeah. will kill you. That's yeah. that's what the law requires. But if you're like a Muslim, you can take a Christian woman. So I think all the gene flow mostly went from Egyptians to Arabs, not so much from Arabs to Egyptians. Like there's no way that would be a death sentence for you. But, you know, I read I read a story, uh, guys, about I think we talked about this, um, maybe me and Stilgar, about the Muslim conquest of Egypt. Or I can't remember, but I read this story like... Um, you know, during after the Muslims took over Egypt for a long time, Christians were still the majority, like up until the Crusades. And of course, the Egyptians didn't like it. They didn't like the Muslim rule. Um, but there was the Muslims would use them to, to row the, the war galleys, you know, when they're fighting with the Byzantines. And there was one case where um, the Egyptian rowers actually abandoned the Muslims and defected over to the, the Byzantines because they saw it as a chance to escape the oppression. And I was thinking, man, what if I was an Egyptian guy and I managed to save up a little bit of money, you know, with bribes and connections and be like, I'm going to go to Europe where it's mostly Christian. You know, even if it's a different form of Christianity, it's Catholic. I'd still rather be there than, you know, uh, underneath the Muslims. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to to Europe. You know, they used to be our friends back in the kind of friends, I guess, back in the Roman period. We have some we have some history together. You know, we used to build buildings together. They used to come and visit my country as tourists. I'm gonna go there. I'll tell them I'm, you know, I'm uh I'm from Egypt, you know, I'm respectable. You go to Europe, you manage to get there, you land in Italy, and you you know, you start to settle in and they're like, Gypsy and <laughs> you're like, <laughs> like, what do you mean by that? Like, you're an Egyptian. You're a menace. Like, I'm an Egyptian, but I'm not a menace. I'm the most, I'm one of the most civilized people in the world. I'm an architect. I, you know, and, and all this stuff. And like, no, no, we just caught some of you yesterday stealing from uh, 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 the market. I'd be like, oh, my goodness. What is this now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think you could still reason with them, though. You'd be like, no, no, I come from Egypt. This is my culture. Assuming yeah. they let you talk. Assuming they let you talk. If it's a low IQ person, they might not even let you talk. They might just jump on you. But I think you could I think you could probably talk your way out of it, depending on who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with some dummy, then you probably can't talk your way out of it, but I'd probably take my chances in Europe. Oh, like I it, would too. Even uh, now in in Egypt, uh, like if you're a cop and you're uh, you have a daughter that's exceptionally good looking, uh, what 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 ends up happening, Great Pharaoh? Uh, if you if you can you repeat the question? Yeah. So if you if you're a cop living in uh, Egypt and you end up with a really good looking daughter, what do you have to be afraid of? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, for her to be abducted, uh, for one, I mean, abductions happen all the time, and they try to convert them and marry them. And then they make them like get on a video camera and tell them that they're happy that they've converted Islam and they've made this decision. But really, I mean, she's pretty much got a gun to her head. I mean, um, yeah, that's what happens, you know, and that, that's uh, that's still happening today. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, Very yeah, it's also happening in uh, with the like other like minorities, like the. Uh, for example, and I was reading about this the other day in Pakistan. It was also the Hindus. They have to. There's still some Hindus left there. Yep. And they uh, they take the the good looking Hindu girls, and then uh, and then you go to the authorities, but they say, yeah, well, we have these papers here from Imam uh, Khalma, and they say that uh, she converted, you know, so now she's a Muslim and she's the property of her husband now. So that's her new family. So yeah, so it's uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. All right. All right. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, for that one, Ivor. Learned a lot about the uh, the gypsies. Thanks. Yeah. So, definitely. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Well, thanks for thanks for coming, guys. I think uh, I think that's it. I think we can close it unless anyone. Yeah. Has like, share, and subscribe, please. Yes. Appreciate it. We appreciate all our viewers. Thank yeah. Let uh, leave a comment and uh, let us know. 
uh, what you think, if you have any other topics you want us to discuss. Um, if you're a Muslim, uh, let us know if you disagree <laughs> or agree. Uh, seriously, love you guys. And um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Anyways. Thank you so much, guys. Anyways. All right. We will conclude. Yeah. <laughs>